I pulled out the notes to make sure I, my memory was right. And it was, uh, in 1996, the Telecommunications Act was the first bill ever signed in the Library of Congress because we thought we were writing a positive communications manifesto for the next several years. It was a highly complicated bill. The communications law had not been overhauled in 60 years. And John and many of our Democrats wanted to make sure that there was ample room for competition to keep the rates as low as possible and the service as wide as possible. And uh, he worked with Chairman Bliley, and he spoke that day in the Library of Congress as the minority leader of that committee because he was interested in getting something done. His long loyalty to health care is legendary, but in the end, what counts even more than his honoring his father was that he was there for Medicare and Medicaid. He was there for the Children's Health Insurance Program. He was there for the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things that I especially appreciated was his saying that his favorite job in public service was his summer job between his junior and senior year in college as a park ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park. For 59 years, he worked to be sure future generations could enjoy America's national treasure. As far as I know, he supported the efforts of every administration, Democrat and Republican, legislative or executive, to preserve that land. And then he became obsessed with public health. He supported President Nixon in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Health and Safety Agency. He supported the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. I want to just say a couple of things about his record on civil rights. It is true that he endangered his seat in Congress by voting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His Polish immigrant Catholic heritage, his study of social justice with the Jesuits up the street, did not permit him to pull up the ladder of opportunity just because he had climbed it. And he was doing this a long time before the Civil Rights Bill was voted for. In his first term in Congress in 1956, he sponsored an anti-lynching bill, a fair housing bill, and a bill to eliminate the poll tax. As someone who grew up in a state where the poll tax was used to control the black vote, it meant a lot to me. But he became a particular hero of mine when I was only about 13 years old. In 1959, young Congressman Dingell stood before the fearsome speaker, Sam Rayburn, and objected to what is normally routine, the seating of all the new members at the same time. Because one of them was a congressman from my native state, Arkansas, who had defeated the sitting member for supporting the integration of Little Rock Central High School. And he beat him on a write-in campaign in which people were allowed to put printed stickers on the ballot, even though the law didn't provide for it. There were other interesting irregularities. <laughs> but the idea, it sounds simple, a little procedural bill, but I think it's very important, especially to the younger people here who may think of 
John Dinkle is yesterday's man. He was not afraid as a young man to risk the ire of people who could have wrecked his effectiveness to make the point that no one should gain automatic admission to the House if elected under a system that was not genuinely democratic. Finally, in 1961, I told Congressman Lewis that John Dingell accepted uh, an invitation to go to the Union Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, to speak to the NAACP. It's a pretty good gig for a Polish kid from Michigan. <laughs> and the lady who was doing the dinner was trying to do a favor for a young lawyer she thought needed some help because he was making only $35 a week at the time, which wasn't much money even in 1961. So she let this young lawyer introduce John Dingle. And Vernon Jordan did a very good job of it. <laughs> and he called to tell me that to this very day, he was just another one of John's kids that his career really took off after he got to <laughs> introduce John Dingle. Until his last day on earth, John Dingle was doing. When his body wouldn't work anymore and his mind wouldn't stop, he turned to America's national obsession, tweeting, <laughs> and became a Zen master. <laughs> you should read, if you haven't, the collection of John's greatest Twitter hits. I mean, it's Zen mastery. Few words, much wisdom. And if you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. He honored the people who sent him to Congress for 59 years by keeping the sacred pact of doing and doing and doing. We give thanks for his long good life, but the real thing we have to do is to honor it now as he charged us in his last letter. He often quoted what I used to joke was his good friend, Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> who said after, after the Constitutional Convention, when asked what we had been left, he said, a republic if you can keep it. So now he has done all he could help us keep it. And the greatest honor we could ever give him is to spend whatever years we have left at the wheel to the last day. Goodbye, John. Finally, you are in that place of more perfect union where all God's children know how it feels to be free. Thank you. My friends, you've been sitting for a long time. Let's take a moment now to stand and pray. Oh God, your nature is always to forgive and to show mercy. 
we humbly implore you for your servant John, whom you have called to journey to you. And since he hoped and believed in you, grant that he may be led to our true homeland to delight in its everlasting joys. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated again. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. There's an appointed time for everything, and a time for every affair under the heavens, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the plant, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter the stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to be far from the embraces. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to be silent, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time of war, and a time of peace. God has made everything appropriate to its time, but has put the timeliness to their, into their hearts so they, can, so they cannot find out from beginning to end the work which God has done. The word of the Lord. Response can be found in your program. the 
table before me in the sight of my foes you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows the and kindness follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come the A reading of, from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to address the people in these words. In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, who, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of us all. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him and all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Jesus began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. <clears throat> Uh, when I was uh, a young man, certainly uh, by the time I got to high school, um, I was very interested in things uh, having to do with law and politics. My father was a lawyer, and it weighed into where I went to college. And so I went to Claremont Men's College in Southern California. When I arrived at the house eight years ago, it was David Dreyer, a co-alumnus of mine from Claremont, who was happy to see me uh, and uh, welcomed me here. Uh, at Claremont, we learned uh, more than we would ever have learned in ninth grade civics to love and to respect the institutions of government and law in this country. And um, so at Claremont, uh, it was my plan to go on uh, to law school, become a lawyer, eventually uh, to enter politics and replace either Warren Magnuson or Scoop Jackson. <laughs> but then I went to Gonzaga Law School in Spokane, Washington, and I ran in to the Jesuits uh, and I put on the last suit I would ever wear and became a man in black. Fast forward to eight years ago, I had put my imaginings and my hopes of law and politics behind me, done a number of ministries. I was teaching ninth graders out in Portland, Oregon, and my superior asked me to uh, apply for a position that was opening up. I did, uh, and I was interviewed by John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi. I didn't blow the inter uh, interview, and I became the chaplain of the House of Representatives. God had remembered my bucket list. <laughs> so I was in the candy store. Uh, I was like, I came to an institution that I knew and I loved from my studies, uh, I observed from afar, um, uh, well prepared to come having been uh, teaching and coaching 14 year olds. and naturally found my way uh, to the revered elders of the house, who, who welcomed me in a way that other members didn't. Uh, notable among them, Dale Kildee, who is here with us today, uh, Jim Sensenbrenner, graciously the first to come to my office to welcome me. Uh, certainly Walter Jones, God bless him now. 
We would all be in North Carolina were we not here. And John. I never met John. I never knew John as Big John, as the chairman. My, my predecessor said to me, just call everybody by their first name. Don't deal in titles. Don't deal in, because you're not playing the politics here. You're, <laughs> you are ministering to John. You're ministering to Nancy. You're ministering to Patrick. You're ministering to Ben Ray. You're ministering to brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I came to know John. And John, uh, over the years, was always happy to sit, uh, see me. As it was mentioned, he sat in his little perch there in the second row on the Democratic side, along with Dale Kil Kildee. They looked like um, uh, Waldorf and Astor, the two old Muppets, you know, that always <laughs> that sat there and commented on everything and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, when he retired, uh, went back to Detroit, and in those times when he'd come back to the Hill, God bless John, he, he would call me up and want to see me. I said, well, of course, John. Uh, and so I would come over to Debbie's office and, and we would sit, sit down and his first question was, so the most important thing I, I need to know, Father, is are you doing well? And uh, always was. And we would get to talking as, uh, men who talk seriously do. Um, and he would always ask me, he said, Father, at the end of all this, do you think God can forgive me? John, uh, if God cannot forgive us, we are all doomed. God's mercy is greater than God's judgment, but I don't, I don't think you need to worry. He says, what? A, Father, am I all right with the Lord? Do you think I'm all right with the Lord? Now, all the readings of uh, the Mass today, uh, each one uh, takes, uh, in the Catholic Church, hopefully about an eight-minute homily. Uh, if we were in Steny's Church, I'd go 45 on each one of them. <laughs> but I'm, I choose to focus on on the gospel, on the Beatitudes. Now, for those who are not familiar, our uh, non-Christian brothers and sisters, uh, I am so honored that you are here uh, gracing us with your presence here today. Uh, and, and, and for uh, those of us who are Catholic and don't know the scripture very well, um, <laughs> This is the fifth chapter of Matthew. Well, guess what happens in the fourth chapter? Fourth chapter. It's, it's Jesus' temptation in the desert. And one of the temptations that Satan places before Jesus, I'll give you all the power uh, uh, in, the, in this world. I'll give you all the power in this world should you Worship me. And, and, and Jesus says, you know, we worship only the Lord our God, and there shall be no God before him. So Jesus offered power, said, that's not the will of the Father for my mission in life, for my vocation in this life is not that power. It is, I don't have power. I will hold power for the mission. Someone said that as a member of Congress, nobody in government hold, has power. They hold power uh, for the people they serve. As a matter of fact, John, that was you that said that. That's what Jesus was saying. So. The first thing Jesus does after he's been tempted 
by Satan. He comes out, and does he exercise power? No, he comes out with, blessed are the poor in spirit. What? Not a power move. Blessed are the meek. It's not power politics. This is something else. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments being brought into a new understanding. Of, this is the way, if you are to follow God's will, this is the way to be. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of God is theirs. John, are you right with the Lord? You were never poor. John was not poor. Most of us are not poor. So what does it mean, the poor in spirit? It means, I think it means, for those who are holding power to identify with those who have no power. That would be the poor. So that you're not actually poor, but you get it. You're the poor in spirit. And John, you got that. You understood why you held the power of the people. It must have been a great consolation for John, as it was for many of us, when Pope Francis came to the floor of the house and reminded us that the, that the vocation of a politician, the vocation of politics, is a call from God. It is a holy and sacred trust because the purpose of politics is the common good. This is what God calls all of us to, and certainly those who hold power for the people that they serve. Father, I'm and I'm all right with the Lord. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Civil rights. It was mentioned before where John stood on these things, what John was willing to do. John. Did you hunger and thirst for righteousness? And did you do everything you could? Blessed are the merciful. How many fellow Americans, how many people in our world feel the oppression of a merciless, economy, a merciless politics, a merciless society who feel the oppression of a whole world that has no mercy, that is merciless in beating them down. John, you were part of that system, and you showed mercy. You were merciful to so many. Blessed are the merciful John, for they shall be shown mercy. My brothers and sisters who serve now, you are called to serve by your people, but in a profound sense, by a God who loves all God's children. John, you seemed to have understood that. In your life, you chose a vocation, you followed a vocation, understanding full well that the power at your disposal was not yours. It was held by you to serve your brothers and sisters, which you did. 
as a man poor in spirit, who hungered and thirsted for justice, and who showed mercy. At the Last Supper, there was a young man named John who reclined at table and lay in the bosom of Jesus. John, as an old man now, you are born to new life. You are the young John at the eternal banquet. Recline now in the bosom of your Lord Jesus. Please stand. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in him, we join our prayers now. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For John, that God will reward him with peace and joy for the good he did. During his life, we pray to the Lord. Lord. For our nation, may God grant us wisdom to preserve justice and freedom for all people, especially the marginalized and the powerless. We pray to the Lord. Lord. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord. For all young people full of idealism and energy, that they might find focus and meaning in gospel values, the values of the Beatitudes, to build into their lives, we pray to the Lord. Lord. For Walter Jones, who today is being commended to the Lord in North Carolina, that God will reward him with peace and joy for the good he did during his life, we pray to the Lord. Lord our God, hear the prayers of your people. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place In your kingdom, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. In your blue hymnal, number 735, number 735.
My friends, let us pray that our offering be acceptable to God the Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and glory of God's name for our good, the good of all the Holy Church. Look favorably on our offerings, O Lord, so that your departed servant John may be taken up into glory with your Son in whose great mystery of love we are all united through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing or seated as you are able during the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful people, Lord, life is changed, not ended, and when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for us in heaven. And so, with all the angels, archangels, the thrones and dominions, all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the ancient hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. source of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall that they might become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, giving thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat this is my body which will be given up for you. In the similar way, when the supper was ended, he took the cup, once more giving thanks and praise. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer your Father in thanksgiving this life-giving bread and this saving cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence to serve you. We humbly pray that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we might be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, remember your church spread throughout all the world, Help her to grow in love together with Papa Francisco, the College of Bishops, with the clergy, and all, all your holy people of God. Remember your servant John, whom you have called today. From this world to yourself, 
grant that he, who was united with your son in death, a death like his, may also be one with him in his re resurrection. And remember also all our brothers and sisters, ancestors of all, who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your presence, and have mercy on us, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, all the apostles, martyrs, and saints, all who have done your will throughout the ages, we might be co-heirs to eternal life, to praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. and sisters, let us pray together to the Father for the coming of the kingdom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day that by the help of your mercy we might be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your people, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Take a moment to offer peace to those nearby.
Our brothers and sisters, behold. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and happy are we called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy. My friend, for this time of communion, you are all invited to come forward. If you are coming forward to receive communion, we will know that if you put your hands out to receive the body of Christ and then the cup, the blood of Christ. If you're coming just for a blessing, we will know that if you place your hand over your heart. All are invited to come forward. In your hymnal, number 35, 35. Oh. 
number 932, number 932.
your servant John, for whom we have celebrated this Paschal sacrament, may now pass over to a dwelling place of light and peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Congressman Dingell's family invites all present here to a reception immediately following this service in the Healy Family Student Center on the campus of Georgetown University. The center is about a seven minute walk from this church and directions will be available at the exits. Tomorrow, Congressman Dingell's remains will be interred at Arlington National Cemetery at 9 a.m. Those wishing to attend should arrive at Arlington no later than 8.15 a.m. Lastly, following our concluding prayers, please remain in your places until the family has completely exited the church behind Congressman Dingell's remains. Please stand. Before we go our separate ways, let us now take leave of our brother John. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ with, which conquers all things destroys even death itself. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother John in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessing which you have bestowed upon John in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints. Merciful Lord, Turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith until we all meet again in Christ and are with you and with our beloved John forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. John. May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to greet you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. In peace, let us take now our brother to his place of rest. In your hymnal number 984, number 980.